right, guys. Uh, welcome to a Stateline special, Stateline Records. Um, we are here with the owner, Mark. Mark, welcome. You are from Salem, which is the 495 area near Boston. So uh, we are going to be kind of going through what Laura got for her birthday, which was a big bundle of vinyls, um, some pretty cool stuff, some EPs, some LPs. So why don't we just uh, let Laura start with the first one and we'll just talk about them. Okay. okay. Hi, Mark. Hello. <laughs> so we got a beautiful package in the mail like a month ago. Um, and right off the bat, we'll start with one of my most recent faves that I've seen to fallen in love with. Michael Caine and the Morning Afters. Okay, Mike. So Michael Caine and the Morning Afters are from Worcester. They actually have a really interesting story. Um, Mike is my age. Um, he might be even be a little bit older than me. So roughly 44 or so. Um, he has been going to shows forever. The first show, we don't even tell people about this show because nobody was there. But the first Ducky Boy show that I played, there was nobody there except Mike Kane. He was the, <laughs> door, he was the doorman. So he was like the, the security guy there. So we, don't ever, we never even talk about that thing. But that guy's been around forever. And what's really interesting is that Around the time we were getting our band started, he um, he basically had a son. Um, so he kind of had to put his shit on hold, his aspirations. And it wasn't until about five years ago, I think, that he started talking to me about the music that he was starting to write. Or he had, he, I guess he'd been doing it all along, but he wasn't really pursuing it. So his, his cousin, I think it was his cousin died. And um, that motivated him to finally be like, I'm going to, go and I'm going to do this. So that EP that you have is from like, I think 2017 and it was yep. some of their first songs and um, they have just finished recording their full album, which will be out next year, but they are like leaps and bounds ahead of what you hear on that. So if you like what you hear there, you're oh, wow. really going to like what they're going to do next year. Um, yeah. I got um, shut out the lights. Um, what a, fucking heavy song that one is like that's the song that brought i kind of listened to the pack all at the same time but that one had me stop and the chills that came out of it like just like anytime music can evoke any type of emotion out of me it's almost like an insta stopper and that one was so so strong so emotional it was just amazing like he really did a great job with it yeah well, that's the thing about most of that well that whole ep is so beautifully written like the whole thing lyrically musically it's great and i was just like what the fuck <laughs> yeah the um i think we could have got we in retrospect i think we could have got two more songs on there um but we didn't and at, at the time we were like oh we'll be fine we'll do another one soon then you got the album coming up and then one thing Oh, we lost them, Kitty. Nope. The cat stepped on the, um, the mute <laughs> button. Um, this happens all day at work, too. Um, so we ended up not doing a, a follow-up immediately. It took forever, and now he'll finally get that record out next next year. But when you hear it, it's gonna it, it's like a Tom Petty or Bruce Springsteen album. Like he didn't. He's just going for it. Like he waste he he wasted too much of his time not playing music. So he's going for like everything he can think of. Just so I, you know what I wrote. So what I usually do is when I listen to these songs. I'm, I'm really like, curious because I did the same thing. And I, um, I want to see I write Matt. stuff about kind of the things that draw my inspiration. So shut, shut out the lights is the first thing I wrote. Because I was like, that's a crazy emotional song. Mm -hmm. But then I wrote, I don't know if you guys can see my note over here. But it says Tom Petty. Just write it. That was kind oh, of yeah. the first artist that came out to me. It wasn't so much... I do want to say it's part style, but it was like a harder Tom Petty. It wasn't quite like him, but that kind of lyric, that style of being back home in the backyard and just listening and jamming with my friends, that's kind of what Michael Caine and Morning Afters brought for me was, you know, those backyard parties, just talking about the good old days. And yeah, Tom Petty definitely just was always there. He's got like a like the Tom Petty's in there and then like the replacement sloppiness, um, which is really charming. But I think that Mike himself kind of comes across as this really genuine character. Like even if you don't know him, um, I, I feel like I don't just champion what he does because I know him. 
I feel like if you see his video that he has prepared, that's going to come soon. You're just going to see that and be like, this guy's such an authentic character. Um, but yet at the same time, he's performing. It's, it's really hard to explain, but he's really talented and he mixes a lot and he kind of makes his own thing out of all of it. And he does get a lot of those lines, like shut out the lights that will just like stop you. Mm-hmm. And that's, that song was like a, that was a showstopper when I heard it the first time. Oh yeah. I, like I said, I just kind of listen to music and all around my day and that one just like, and like yeah. right in the heart and you can almost feel like the tears almost well up and like that smokiness in his voice. Is that how he talks? Like, do you like talk to him and he's like, you know, talks <laughs> like he sings like that? Um, I'm going to leave that one to mystery. So <laughs> you, you have to go up and approach him at a show or something like that. Um, his voice is really interesting. It reminds me of a band. So Christ with the war stories. Here I go. I'm sorry. Um, years ago, I toured with the U.S. bombs and their guitar player kept talking about this band Dogs de Moor. Um, so it's like dogs, D, you know, like a, your dog, plural. And then it's like D apostrophe a more, you know. Um, and we found one of their, the last show of the tour, we found their CD at a shop in uh, Bend, Oregon. And we the tour ended there. I had to drive home and we listened to that dogs to more album all the way home. And I've never heard anybody else ever talk about them aside from Carrie from the U S bombs until Mike played it. Like I first time I heard a song, I was like, you sound like the guy from dogs to more. And he knew exactly who I was talking about. I don't know where he gets his rock and roll information, but this guy's like an encyclopedia. <laughs> um, he, he kind of has that similar vibe. So check them out. If you get a chance, there's a song called, um, Drunk Like Me, I think it's called. Um, it's, I'm way off topic here, but it, it's reminiscent of Mike's voice. But Mike also sounds like every dude, you know, like that's like your uncle picking up a guitar or your cousin or something. That's what you imagine they're going to sound like. And he just kind of, he hits that nail on the head somehow. But I'm not, it's not like Tim Armstrong where he talks the same way he sings. <laughs> it's, um, <laughs> You're going to have to strike up a conversation with them and find out. You're going to have to have them on the show, I think. I think we got to get to know this guy, especially once his stuff comes out. Um, Do you guys have a release date for the new stuff? No, he wants a release date sooner than I can afford to give him one. So um, I would say probably when this shit starts to clear up and shows start to happen again, he'll have a record then. Um, He's got all everything in the canon and ready to go. Like he's got two videos and he, and like he has just an unbridled enthusiasm that, that I can't contain, but I have to be like, Mike, trust me. Like we got to wait until this shows. Otherwise just, it's just not going to go anywhere. Um, but yeah, he, he'd probably come on here and tell you a lot of stuff. We we'll probably <laughs> talk to him for like six hours. Cause he's just <laughs> like an encyclopedia of rock knowledge. Oh, we can't wait to have him. Yeah. It was, that was what I started my whole package out with. And it was, it was a nice surprise. And I was like, Oh, wow. Okay. I love getting into things that I've never heard before, but that was, uh, it was refreshing. It was something that I, not that I wasn't expecting out of state line records, but a lot of stuff that, that I have is harder, you know? And so it was a little, it was nice to be like, Oh, okay. It was step back a little bit. But the I- Hopefully the idea is that if the band is good, if they have good songs, they'll land here. I hope someday if this shit keeps going. And that's what I love too is that it's not just, you know, a certain style of music, which is what we get with that Michael Caine EP and the new stuff to come too. It's not the same as as everything else. Everything on here is a little bit different, which brings me to this beautiful son of a bitch. Oh, Diablo Gato? Yeah, that thing is... Are you fucking kidding me? (laughs) Like, that is all I have to say about this record. (laughs) Yeah, that that one I gotta hand it to the guitar player Chuck from Diablo Gato. He did the layout and he just chose the vinyl <clears throat> variations and stuff. Wow, I mean he got it right, and their logo is so cool. Yeah, I mean, I mean, just, that's like, beautiful. That everything about the whole presentation is beautiful, but the actual music on it is—it's a curveball. <laughs> yeah, they're doing something really, really interesting. It's like it's not punk and it's not like country. It's this like swampy. Um, I get like this, like I hate just like, like, like dirty thing. rock and roll vibe from it, yeah. you know. Like, <laughs> you know, there's this one 
what is, what's the name of that fucking show that Drew really likes? I don't know. I always think of like I don't want to say Yeehaw because that's not it. But I always feel like you know when you're on a train and you're seeing that train dude and like he's in there singing his songs and shit. <laughs> like that's kind of what. <laughs> you mean like a hobo? No, not like a hobo. <laughs> but yes, that's fuck. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. But you know, just kind of like passing through the. I'm a very visual person. Anytime it comes to music, there's always pictures coming in my head. There's just, it's just how I listen. I don't know. Maybe I'm just me, but I don't know. But every time something like that, like I kind of feel like that summer breeze and you're going through like the train yard and you're just like passing these towns and shit. And that music that would be playing is what would be on that album right now. That's awesome. I love hearing descriptions of like how It's so good though. It's just music. another, it's just another total polar opposite from you know what we were just talking about from michael came in the morning after you know so going into something like that it's just holy shit but they're nailing whatever style this is like it's i don't even really know what to call it oh i remember the show's name twin peaks i'm not a fan of it but drew loves that show and i swear to god they sound like the freaking twin peaks twin peaks soundtrack from what i've heard of it (laughs) um yeah, th- that's the thing about Boston is like, uh, so both of those bands happen to be from, well, Michael Caine's from Worcester, but Gabble Gatto's from Boston and Rhode Island. Um, the scene here has always been really varied. You know, I'm go- sorry with the stories, but. Yeah. Like, <laughs> we love the stories. Yeah, and then, keep going. You fill our content with them. <laughs> <laughs> in the 90s here in Boston, there was, um, you know, like there was the punk scene, which we were playing in and there was Unseen and Dropkick and stuff. And then there was the ska scene with like Big D. Um, and then there was, uh, you know, the hardcore scene with my brother's band, Blood for Blood, and In My Eyes and these bands. But they were all like siloed. Um, there was a rockabilly scene, the Amazing Royal Crowns, the Kings of Nothing. They didn't cross over much until they did. And then I saw how, like Boston really, hit, no offense, but Boston had the best bands at, at that point in time um, in every genre. So that's kind of what, we aim to recreate with that the choices of the bands so you know diablo gata was way different than michael kane in the morning afters which i, I hope like is way different that right on the head though i and i think that that's awesome and that's i say it to terry all the time i've been saying it forever because i'm in central new york but i there's no better place to go to shows than boston because you can make a weekend out of stuff and you get anything and everything that you could possibly want so I love coming to Boston for stuff like that. And the bands and the music that I've found just going a few hours that way is crazy. If you like Boston now, you, you had to be here in the mid to late nineties when they would, they would be like 750 kids would turn up to see a local band. It was crazy. Like that just, yeah, that's fucking awesome. but um, it, it was really the, the variety of the great, and different bands that made it like, cause I only went to punk shows. I didn't know shit about um, big D and the kids table or the ska scene. I mean, I knew who the boss tones were, but who didn't, um, but they never interacted. And then suddenly like the walls came down and blood for blood was playing with dropkick Murphys and stuff. And, and it was just like, there's a little bit of everything here. And that's, that's kind of the, the hope, but then stolen wheelchairs came out of nowhere and kind of broke up the, the Boston thing. So we'll get there, I guess. Right. Yeah, we will get there. We will definitely get there. What do we have next? Yes. Oh, 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 I loved this. This little duck and cover couple oh, yes. songs on here. This was this released this year or yeah. 2019? Okay. It was it's, January. It was January, but it feels like about eight years ago. <laughs> Pre-pandemic. Yeah, that thing is excellent. It's and so much fun. Th- they're an incredible band. Um they're one of those, like, I, I don't really know those guys, which is unusual. Like, all the bands on the label, I know them in some way. There's some connection to them in the past, you know. But those guys I just met from playing. And um, they're, that EP is, like, when they sent it to me, I was like, which one's this? Because they said they wanted to do, like, a single with a couple of B-sides. I'm like, which one's the single? Because they're all really good. <laughs> yeah, well, that was the thing. I, I As I listened to it, um, I'm like, there's no like top contender here really. You know what I mean? Usually when you put something like that out, there's one that's really, that's your single, like you just said, but this is all of, all three of these tracks are solid as fuck. Yeah. And then I got listening to some of their other stuff too. And I'm just like, Good. 
I want to hear a full length. I need something more. <laughs> the most they have is a 10 inch right now, but that was like their first release. So yeah, mm-hmm. hopefully they do something more. Um, they just got like, they got great songs and, and like their thin Lizzie style guitar dueling. Uh, it, they just hit on everything. They just a, a really great rock band. I, I know the pandemic kind of like came along and everything that got released in just nationwide, you know, like from January to March, like that anti-flag album and everything, all of it just kind of got flushed in a way after the pandemic. I hope people go back and revisit like that anti-flag album or this, uh, the drowns were another one and this duck and cover out um, EP. Cause it, I think all of those records would have been, had they not been a disaster this year, they would have been really well received. I think. Yeah. And, oh, uh, there's no doubt about it. You know, we talked about this earlier in the 90s, early 2000s punk, and I found that album to hit it right on the head. Like, that was exactly where it brought me back to back in the day, back in the skate park. That's exactly what I would have played while I was out there. It was fantastic. I agree with both of you. So it was not a bad song on it. I think I just were three songs that was mm-hmm. on that album, and they were every, all three songs are fantastic. Yeah, usually when when somebody sends you something, you're like, which one's supposed to be the standout? It's a bad thing. But when they sent that to me and that was the question, I was like, this is this is freaking excellent. All yeah, three- and as a listener too, I'm like, what am I supposed to, there's no, I always, I always have like a top one or two, but I mean, even though that's like we said, only three tracks, they're all really, really great. They're Makes me fun, wonder what 12 fast. would have done. Yeah, like it, they um, hit everything. It would have been like Appetite for Destruction. Yeah, I'm very excited to see. Um, Do you kind of have plans with them for the future as to where you guys want to go? Or they're just kind of mauling around, I guess, with COVID. You never know. But Yeah, nobody really knows what's up. So I I don't know. I guess we'll see. I mean, I I hope they – I mean, even if they do it themselves, I hope they – do it regardless just yeah just get it done it. yeah i would love to hear more from them they were, that was one of my faves out of here for sure um up next we have warning shots i really love um i love this clear vinyl and i love the album artwork on here sorry my leg sucks that's okay <laughs> so i should everybody just you just go buy your own copy of it and you can look <laughs> at it yourself <laughs> so that one is um so i'm actually in that band but i don't I didn't send that to you for that reason. Um, Wait, I, really? Yeah. I usually don't send anything that I'm in, I'm involved with to anybody because that's just weird. Um, but <laughs> the thing is that I feel like the other guys in that band really deserve to have the songs heard because um, they're really good. And um, so I included it. But Nick and Rich, um, the thing about that band is like in, in my music playing history, I always kind of like did the writing and stuff like that. Not, all, not 100% of it, but the, most of it. And it wasn't like that in that band. And Rick, uh, Rich and Nick have two, I mean, um, a two and fantastic songwriters. And they have a bunch of songs in that record that I think they deserve to have heard. Um, if it was just me involved in that thing, I never would have sent that to you. But um, there's the band themselves. Like, they're just like the, they're such a talented band. And I don't know why they let me hang around because um, they did all the heavy lifting. Um, but Rich just put out a new e- a new single and a video called RC95. Um, so that's uh, kind of a, that's him and the drummer uh, from the warning shots. And um, he's kind of picking that up, but Nick moved to the Caribbean. So I don't know what he's doing. Oh, cool. I mean, I'm sure he's fucking loving life, <laughs> but um, he, I don't think he's playing any music right now, uh, but they were, they started together in a band called the Morgan knockers. Um, they were from Waltham, Massachusetts. And Jesus. Um, they're really, really, really good. Um, so that they're worth hearing to is the Morgan knockers. Um, but that's why I sent you the warning shots. So I just, yeah, wanted to- I, I loved it. I, and I was just going to say that was um, a band in this package that I've never heard of before. So it, it's weird. It's funny what people have said about that band. Like, I went on a podcast. Um, no, I'm sorry. Uh, like a college radio show recently. And the dude said that he thought he interpreted the warning shots to be like, if um, meat loaf or something was a punk rock band, <laughs> like, like Broadway performance almost. And I, and I know part of it is you have to see it live on stage because we look like a bunch of goons, ca- cartoon characters, cartoon characters. Um, but um, I forget where I was going with that. Um it is. Yeah. He was right though. At first I was like, what the hell does he mean? And then I kind of got it. It's like a, 
it's like a production almost when we would play on stage, but we didn't do much out of Boston. Um, and I'm talking in the past tense, but if Nick comes home, we're doing it again. We're back. So we'll see. Well, Nick, if you're watching and if you come home, we're here for it. Yeah. Come home, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> Just come home. We've all tried and that he on. He probably him. does not want to come anywhere near here right now. No, <laughs> no not right now. He's like waking up every day, laying in a hammock and strumming an acoustic guitar under the sun. He's not missing Waltham and the snow. Maybe or we're anything. coming to Nick. <laughs> That's a good idea. See? Yeah. Okay. I found so this album. Nick- oh, well, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I found that album to be catchy. That was a lot of a lot of catchy riffs were definitely part of this one. Um, a lot of things that piqued my ear. Um, at first, it's funny because I honestly thought it was kind of like a pop punk album and then I started really like about 30 seconds in that completely changed and then it went definitely hard and then it definitely went a little bit I want to say skate and you guys kind of hit the spectrum all over the place for this one um breathe was the one I wrote down softer song but it was fantastic I just I can't say anything the voice and everything the singing even was so gorgeous in it like so th- that's exactly why I sent the record to you guys then. Cause that song breathe is like, that is rich. That that's his songwriting at, um, at like its essence right there. Um, he does like a lot of words that are kind of um, esoteric, I guess would be the, they're, they're not like what I would do or what Nick would write. We write like a words that add up to like a storyline, but rich writes these really, um, I don't even know, intangible kind of concepts that, uh, I find it to be very interesting, um, but they they are kind of in a category under themselves, I guess, in a way. I mean, yeah. I, mean he, I know who his influences are, but I don't see the same in those bands. So I, it's unique to him in a way. Um, he's got a real talent. And that, that was the point of the, the, so the whole point of the warning shots as a band when we started was to have my gnarly sounding voice and then have their really pretty sounding voices in the choruses. And then it started to turn into a, we could, you know, we could all hit the verses and, and sound. So it does end up sounding like a bunch of stacked vocals because that's what it is. So, but it's done well, you know, like it's very, I don't, I don't know if polished is the right word, but that's, it makes sense. You know, like when you have the puzzle of four different pieces and they just fit perfectly, that's exactly what this album was for me, especially breathe was the big highlight of that, you know, that, merge with vocals and everything really like it's a such a soft song and normally i'm not too drawn to those that type especially in punk but this one was like i get this this is nice like i could definitely play this and enjoy it and you know feel something from it it's funny because like in in punk rock um people have to that can be both a good thing and a bad thing Uh, what you just described like it can kind of it can either appeal to everybody or nobody latches onto it because it doesn't identify and sum up something that people can put on a patch on their sleeve. Um, H2O in my recollection was one of those bands that really could play with anybody. Um, and they, they did it in a simple manner and they, they were a big inspiration on what the warning shots were trying to do. We were trying to do exactly what you just said, which was play with anybody. You know, we, one week we opened for um, Cox Barra and the next week we were playing with like the casualties or something like that. They're just yeah. like, completely vague I mean, yeah. really completely polar opposites but it kind of could work and h2o is the big inspiration on that obviously not in the songs necessarily but in the way that they unshakably would open for anybody at any time because they knew that they they would just approach it like we got something to offer here and if you don't like it fuck off <laughs> so we we tried that for a while and then some people were like fuck off and we we're like okay well i guess we'll just take a break for a while <laughs> um <laughs> But when it comes back. I'm very stoked for that. Yeah, me too. That was, it was a good one. And like I said, I love new music and throwing that on. It was nice. And I had no idea that you were in that band. So that's oh, yeah. even more cool. Or uncool, depending on, uh, on on where you stand. So. No, um, it's a great album. It's very, I find that one to be incredibly it's a well thought out album, you know, you can tell that you guys are masters of your craft in it. Um, sometimes when people throw stuff together, it's 
I don't want to say it's off, but it's just, there's something just not quite right. I didn't find that at all with this album and I love it. I just, it was really good, really thought out too. Like you can tell there was a huge thought process put behind those songs, which I appreciate. Well, thank you for saying that because most people don't actually pick up on stuff like that. So, um, <laughs> and that, uh, those guys like Nick and Rich really labored over some of those things. And Benny, the producer guy who recorded several of these bands too, um, he has a lot to do with that sort of thing. And he kind of taps, he kind of understands what, what we're all doing. He did the Diablo Gato record and the Art Thieves. Um, probably some other ones that I'm not even thinking of, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just rambling. Yeah, for me, it was one of those albums, too. You know, I always think, too, when you first listen to a record, <clears throat> you have to listen to it the way that it's on the record, the way the band intended you to hear it. And this is one of those that lays out right from the start to the end. You can tell it was, like Terry said, a, a nice thought out process. It was, it's literally, it's it's a piece of art presented to you. So mm -hmm. It's refreshing and it's nice when you have, when you can tell that the band is putting thought into it like that, you know, it's not something that's thrown together quick. It's an actual process that you're given and an experience to go on. And I like that. That's really interesting. Um, I, n I never really get to hear what other people think of music. I only think of what I think of it, you know, so to hear what other people think of it is. And that's what's fun uh, for <clears throat> Terry and I lately is we're getting into the more, you know, not just like, oh, hey, we really like this song, but into the, okay, well, what are, what are their, what are they thinking when they're giving this to us? Obviously, they care enough about it to give it to us this way, so why? And it's fun to kind of explore that question, that, that why. Hmm. And I think that record does a really great job. Yeah, I think as non-musicians, um, but I do have musical training, I do have a very big musical background you know I know the time and process that can go into something like this like I went more into production side so I only know what I do and it takes for fucking ever sometimes so I can <laughs> imagine what you know that's why I'm a visual person I can take things and put them and make a story out of it as to how I feel about it but you guys doing that through music to me is a feat well beyond what I can ever do because everybody can see, we can all feel these feelings, but you guys to put it like to sound and with instruments and with a story, I, it's amazing. See, that's funny because like, I see this sort of thing as like, um, whatever it's like playing a uh, pickup game of basketball or something like that. But if somebody can draw a picture, it blows my friggin' mind because it's I can't. So <laughs> hmm? It's so funny how people just on the other side of the coin, you know, I can't draw yeah. with shit though. So don't. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't even draw. I, I literally have um, a record pad around here where I drew stick figures for a proposed video for art thieves. And it's that it's really that bad that I had to draw them like stick figures. Like I can't <laughs> draw. So if somebody can draw, it blows my mind. Um, it's funny. Hmm. We'll introduce you to our friend Paul later on. But all right, Laura, what else do we have down the list? Okay. All right. So this is a, well, actually not a sneak peek. I talked about this on our Sunday spin because oh, I've yes. literally been spinning this since I got it. I oh, love this one? band. <laughs> and I have for a, lo a long time and it's awesome that there's new Ramallah out. <laughs> and it's great that it's so good. Yeah, you know, and it's too short. They have more, though. Did I turn this thing off? No, nope. you're still on, right? No, we we okay. can hear you. <laughs> um, hear you. It, that thing is, I, I think it's fantastic. They have way more in the can, too. I mean, like, really? They, that is wonderful to hear because it, it does, it leaves you wanting more. And I told Terry this the other day. It's almost, um, it's another one of those that you go like on a journey. And you hear a little bit of blood for blood in it, but you also, obviously, you know, but um, lyrically, it's so deep and so heavy. And you can tell that there's like a lot he has to say. And I think it's great. And it hits really fucking heavy on a bunch of different levels. Yeah, he really has the ability to um, explore the ugliness of life in some ways and then kind of somehow make it presentable. and Give it to you so level. beautifully, though. Yeah, it's like you're listening to it and you're like, oh, my God, this is a beautiful song. But then you listen to the words and you're like, oh, my God, 
you know? <laughs> but it, not in a bad way. It's just, it has just a way of really captivating you and making you listen to the whole song for what it really is. Yeah, their writing ability is something that I don't understand either. It's like some sort of, um, it's not like, uh, how do I explain it? Like, uh, I feel like I'm talking another language. I'm not. Um, Rob is like that guy that goes through way too much thought and detail. Um, whereas I'm like the, it's like the Hudson Falcons, you know, those guys, um, Mark Linsky always would just be like, it's rock and roll, you know, whatever it's rock and roll. And like, it, he's right. Like you should just be able to plug and play. And that's, that's how some people play punk rock music. But Rob does this other thing. It's, I don't know what the hell it is. It's like he chooses to play hardcore, but he could do like Elliot Smith style music if he wanted to, but he ends up being like this, what's he called? White trash Rob is what he calls himself. So he ends up being <laughs> that guy. Um, that's what he chooses to do, but he could really do anything. I don't, I don't get what some, some of the stuff he does is like, just like beyond my comprehension. It's oh, always, he's super, oh, go ahead, Terry. Yeah. It's always nice to see somebody who can, pretty much transcend any genre if they really wanted to and decide that punk's going to be their thing. And that's where they say it. And they give us the gift. I, you know, to me, anyone that gives me punk is to me giving me a gift. So Rob, <laughs> thank you. If you are well, watching that's this, the definitely... thing with this record is like, it's punk, but it's not, I, I, I don't know, but it's what not really thought? super hardcore either. I, yeah, it's kind of like <laughs> it blends everything he's ever done before kind of into one type Terry, of that's song. exactly what I said the other day. I was like, this is a catalog of Rob Lynn's work. This is all of yeah. his stuff meshed into one record. It's basically like he's there's songs that could be Sinners and Saints and there's songs that could be Blood for Blood and they performed as Ramallah. And they, it's, I don't know. It's just like really, really catchy, but his next one could turn out to be like a skull cracker. You know, it might, you just never know what you're going to get. The last one that he did, the EP with three songs was like so dark and ugly that um, it was actually they're, disturbing in some ways. Right. They're very different. And it's nice to kind of see that. I don't want to call it a transition, but more of like a, it's, he's just very versatile, I guess you would say. He knows kind of like, again, how to captivate you and make you listen to exactly what he has to say and what he has to express. And I am here for it. I do also like his branding because he kind of uses like themes throughout his, like recurring themes throughout his albums. And, um, you know, some of my friends will kind of like goof on it, but he's still that white trash Rob guy 30 years later. So I guess the joke's not on him i mean he's he's still doing it um but he does do recurring themes of like wasted youth and like you hear him say like the cold street lights a lot and shit like that <laughs> um but it's charming i think it's a little theme running through all of his different his different albums and songs i love it i'm excited that there's more there's a lot more like there was some things when they put that out um there were some songs that he had that i didn't know why they weren't on there it's just like what happened to the, he has this one song called like a note to the undertaker and he literally had a, a note that he kept in his pocket when, during his drug days that he would keep in the um uh, his jacket pocket to the undertaker saying like what his final wishes would be or something wow. and um they have a song called the uh, note to the undertaker and then there's a second version of it um and they're both recorded somewhere but they're not released and it, it reminds me of when i was a kid and like um you know, Guns N' Roses put out Appetite for Destruction and they left a bunch of those old songs off of it. And I was like, well, why didn't you include these? I have to wait now for the next four fucking years. You guys to do another <laughs> album. You could have included them right off the bat. Well, that's where I'm at with him. But they do have a bunch more stuff and hopefully they'll they'll do something next year too. We'll see. Awesome. So who do we have next, Laura? Okay. So oh. my two favorites are left. I'm going to save my all-time fave for, for last. So I'm going to give you this one. I love art themes. Okay. But this record, though, is really, it's great. It's another one that it hit and any genre. It's right here. Like, it's it's here. The, there's not one certain style of music. There's not a certain style of writing. It's all over the fucking place. But it's so beautifully done. Every track is so different from the one right before it. 
Yeah, these guys were new to me, and that was actually the first time for me to listen to them. And I just didn't know what – usually I could put bands in certain little pockets. I, I couldn't with them at all. I just – I had no idea. Um, but, yeah, just – some of it I found it to be dirty. Some of it I found it to be pretty. Some of it I found it to be hard. And others, like, I just, this one gave me a giant mind fuck as to what <laughs> pocket I wanted to put them. I couldn't. I just, I could not. I think that's why I love it so much is because you're constantly, like, your focus is, like, oh, oh, my God. Okay, so this is a little different. Like, a couple songs, I'm, like, oh, my God, they remind me of the Briggs. And then I'm, like, oh, very swinging udders. Oh, my God, this reminds me of the Bouncing Souls. And I swear to God I said that. Every, every song reminded me of a different band or a different sound that I've heard. And it was just like, you're getting all of these favorite things that you love about punk rock all in one beautiful fucking neon pink record. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that that record is out of this world. Like that, It is great. <laughs> that, I think that thing should have been, he should have got a Grammy for that. Uh, I mean, they, they but it, whenever... Whenever I deal with the band, there's always like the one guy I deal with. So I'm, I always refer to him, I mean, not Deves, because of Andrew. But um, clearly, that was like a that was a gang effort. I mean, they I, I don't know I don't know what they can do to top that, except that um, last week Andrew sent me a demo, like a home recorded thing on my phone that it was even better than anything that's on there. Oh so God. hopefully they will even top it. But it's one of those ones where like. He says now, like he can, if if his career in music, career, you know, in quotes, <laughs> um, in music ended today, he would be fine with it because he finished that album and he's t- completely satisfied with it. It is fantastic. It, yeah, it's it's, it, it's beyond. I mean, it's there's, there's like songs on there that should be on the radio. Yeah, yeah. For, like proxies. Okay, I, I I put that on like four or five times, and I'm like, why is this not? Why doesn't everybody know this song? And you could say that about probably half of these. I had DIY USA running as mine. Yep, like, I was just going to yeah. say that one. There's a video for that one. So good. You know, that hardcore, but then it stopped midway through with like yeah. this crazy pop beat and then went right back to hardcore. And I'm like, where did this yeah. come from? Like, what the f- is this? But it, it worked. It really did work. I ha- I didn't find anything. Like, I have five songs on here. Um, they're the ones I probably wrote about the most because it was just so all over the place. I was just like, I don't, I love all of it. It's, yeah. That one, So I'm Being Lied To, I think is like, that, that should be, yeah. that, that should be like the national anthem for 2020. Um, <laughs> Seriously. It, the band is just like so good. And the, I got to tell you about a little more about Andrew because he's like super talented. Um, like a lot of these guys in these bands, like Rich and Nick, all, all those guys I've mentioned, they're all really talented. Um, and those, I think Rich, Rick and, <laughs> I always mix that in, Nick and Rich could also cut it in the same way as Andrew. But um, in the old days when the Beatles had to record and they would have to g- gather around one microphone and perform it perfectly, um, that the need to be able to do that would have excluded the vast majority of people in any of these bands of the records that you've shown, including me, it would not have knocked Andrew out of, out of the ability to record. He could have made that album in 1962 just as easily as he could have made it a couple of years ago. He's like that talented and he has that kind of musical brain that like, it's, it's like watching somebody play chess to me. I have no fucking clue what they're doing, but I know it's going to end up in the right place somewhere or something. But, um, He's he's really really gifted, and I don't know where the hell that album came out of. Because even like the one before it, they have one that's like it's called I think it's called for free. Um, yeah, I saw that one. It has the picture like right on the cover and stuff. It's like a hand drawn picture. Kind of yeah, like <laughs> it's all right. You know, it's all right, but it's not that. It's not Russian rats. No, and um, it. I just couldn't believe it when they. I mean, I. I kind of could because I knew them <laughs> like I knew Andrew's capabilities but when he was like here's the final thing and they had like chimes and stuff going in the songs I was like what the fuck is this like he just they hit everything they left no stone un- unturned no it is beautifully done again one of those ones from top to bottom where you're, every song on there is a banger every single song yeah. in its own different way 
whether it be like Terry said, a little more hardcore, a little more pop punk, everything's catchy. Everything is so beautifully written. It, it, that was a top contender out of this whole pack for sure. I agree. I think that, more. I think they're really good. Do you, um, they have any plans for future records? This one came out in September, 2018. So, so they're oh. probably about due for it. Right. Yeah. Um, I, We're ready. <laughs> <laughs> you just got it a month ago. Come on. <clears throat> um, so I don't know how those guys do it because I think each of them has three kids at least. Oh, wow. Um, but they remain productive somehow and they're working on new songs. I don't think they're getting together during the pandemic or anything like that. But um, I know Andrew does his demos at home with like a drum machine and then they go back later and John, John, the, uh, both the other guys in the band are named John. So John, the drummer, um, we'll make, you know, the robo drum sound like a real person. And then John, the bass player will do his thing too. Um, so they are working on new stuff per se, I guess we'll have to see what happens, but, um, uh, the, you know, I, I got the opportunity to maybe rent a, a place to do like a live stream and have some of these bands come and play and, uh, it's not worth it right now because the the first band I wanted to get was Art Thieves. Um, then when Andrew started telling me about like you know his kids and stuff, I'm like, never mind. I'm not. It just yeah. we'll, we'll pick it up in June or something like that. Um, As parents, we get it. Um, Laura and I, we have babies. We're going to try to protect them. And with yeah. this, you can't take a chance. It's not even right. Good, right. It's it, deviating from like. Any, like, I don't know how some of these bands have performed that have done um, these live streams because they sound fucking good. Like you guys yeah. been practicing? Like you've been pra <laughs> you guys been practicing because you should be following the social distance in there. Um, but I don't know. I don't know how um, those bands would play anyway because like they would have to practice, and that that that's the risk right there is getting into the practice room. Um, so anyway, we'll have to wait until next year, but that's fine. Um, hopefully by then Andrew will have another masterpiece uh, ready to go to the recording studio. For me, it's one of those ones too. Um, I think I said this about a, a while back, we did an interview with um, Jenny from Bad Cop, Bad Cop, and they're one of my favorites. So it's like, you know, when one of your favorite bands drops a new album, you, you go into it with like, oh shit, like what if it's not, what if it's not as great as the one that they just put out that I fell in love with, you know? Um, but it, it was even better somehow. So I'm excited <laughs> to hear more Art Thieves because this was fucking awesome. This might be one of my favorite current records. It's really, really great. Are we still the next one or the Art Thieves? Oh, no, Art Thieves. But this one too is definitely, I'll give you a sneak peek. It's my album of the year. Really? Still in wheelchairs. Oh, yeah. Well, they, they, they really hit the ball out of the park on that one. Oh, my God. It is a masterpiece. It's great. Everything about it is great. I'm curious to hear what, I mean, okay, so I, okay. Um, <laughs> like I said, I'm so used to my own take on things uh, and I never hear from anybody else, except somebody will write me a note and be like, love the stolen wheelchairs. That's all I know that I don't know what they like about them or anything, but I know what I like about them. Um, I think that Oscar, the, the kid, Oscar, he's a, uh, He's, He's got gone. something it's going. Just... Yeah. Like it's, it's not even about this one. Like this, this album's great, but it's just the beginning. Yeah. You know, it's like, the it... whole, it's everything about, when you I, said I, that, I, it's I think dope. everything about him is what punk rock fucking is today. Like that kid is to me, the epitome of punk. Like you go out there, you do everything completely on your fucking own. And you're like, here, this is what I have for you. Now let's fucking do something with it. And he is fantastic. Yeah. And he's the sweetest peach in the world. Like, Laura, can you make it even better? Like things. Yeah. Um, you know, for, I think back to 19 year old me and what a piece of shit I was. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, definitely 19 year old me was, you know, fuck nothing compared to 19 year old Oscar. Now, if people here do not know Oscar's story, Young Oscar, Oscar, I think it's four, five, or six. I don't know. What's the fourth. It? Yeah. He's the fourth. Um, Stolen Wheelchairs was created by him. His dad plays. He's got a friend who does the drums. And then his dad, I want to say, or I don't no, know. I, no, think I, I, think, I think they got um, Lou is the um, the younger kid now on bass. There was another yeah. guy. 
There is another guy. And, um, and, he's, and lose the, the permanent base player now, I think. Yeah. Now, Oscar, if you don't know him, is 19 now. He wrote this when he was 17, 18, and pretty much did all of it himself. Like, everything. Master. Er, 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 he well, and so, most of this, right? He did the recording on this. So, um, yeah. the on the EP, it was just Oscar playing everything. Yeah. And, and he recorded it. And he was 16 at, or 15 at the time. Um, but now the band plays. So I think Lou, um, uh, Milo, and Oscar three are on the album. Um, and I, I presume they probably did some co writing with Oscar four. I presume. I don't know. I, I really don't know the whole story. I kind of just. Um, I like to think Oscar's like this 19 year old fucking punk rock savior kid. So I'm going to go with that story. Cause that's what I like. <laughs> so bringing it back. Like, you know, it's, it's kind of like where I kind of wish my kids will be, you know, when they turn 19. So 10 years from now and Oscar is always the first thing that pops in my mind, even if they don't become punks or anything like just his work ethic, the fucking will that kid has is beyond, you know, we always, I, use this analogy at home all the time is you look at an athlete and then you look at a professional athlete and the professional athlete is just a whole next level above athlete, you know, like just everything about them, the way they fucking train, the way they wake up, their fucking will, the fucking like just that that's Oscar to me. And that's amazing. And I can't wait to see what this kid comes up with later on. Cause the shit now is just blowing me right away. I yeah. you know. It's I'm with you 100% on that. And that's Absolutely. that's a lot of the thinking that I had when... So I know his dad from when he wasn't far from finished. Um, and I think I connected with Oscar on Facebook, younger Oscar. And he was like, like I said, he was like 16 at the time. He put up a, a link to his band camp demo. And the it, it was good. And the fact that he played it all himself was good. But really what was on my mind when I heard it was like, what's this kid going to do when he's 30? Um, if he's capable of this now, just knowing like even as simple as punk rock is and how it's made to be played by people who don't necessarily have a real musical talent. He really does have musical talent and he's playing that form of music. But um, if he could construct that all in his imagination and record every instrument like he's Dave Grohl, then what could the future be? I had no idea he was going to be this ambitious kid, though. Like It was like the jackpot as far as like finding um, a band to be on a small independent label because like you said that kid is i mean he he he's working like as his own publicist he's he did his own recording he did his own mix uh, i think benny mixed it um but he did some tweaks <laughs> um he's just there's something about that kid he reminds me of a young ken casey in some ways i guess we'll and have to I see think that that's the reason that i have so much respect for for him for this band is because you know like terry said it's not necessarily the fact that he's a punk rocker he is without a doubt 100 percent a professional and you hear it through and through and the fact that you kind of can see the progression in him and that you know as listeners we want we want to hear what oscar's gonna sound like in another five years another 10 years we want to watch him continue to put this shit out because it's fucking mind blowing. And I think punk rock needed that now. Yes. Like I'm not saying that everybody's old because not everybody's <laughs> old, but you know what I mean? Like yeah, it needs the next generation. A lot of people shit on the younger kids. They're posers. Absolutely. They're not, th no, they're just young. That doesn't mean shit. It just means that they're young. And that just means they have a lot more time to perfect their craft and to give that shit to you. And I think that's why I love this band so much is because I see that and I'm stoked for more. I can't wait. Every time I see an interview posted, I'm like, those are my babies. <laughs> <laughs> he, so Oscar already sent me new songs that I've obviously done since he finished this album. I don't even want to wait on those. Like, <laughs> I, I think it needs to be like documented now. Like he needs to go record those and like, let's do another seven inch in the spring. If that's what it comes down to. Um, he's just got so much, so much talent. He's just, he's not running out of ideas. He's, he's just like bursting out of the seams. That yeah. Thing. It's just, that's crazy. I and know. He's another one too. He's so versatile. Like every track is a little bit different, mm -hmm. but you still, you get that straight nineties, like 
street punk right punched in your face. Like <laughs> you immediately hear the unseen and the casualties and shit like that. You're like, oh my God, whoa, this is this is yeah. refreshing. This is what those are bands I fell in love with, you know, getting into punk rock for the first time. Like that's how I just started to get my hands into things. So to hear it in the next generation is really cool. And, and it, to it have to be again just going back to his character is so so amazing because it's it's tough to find people like that yeah I, i'm really hopeful for his future um i don't see any reason why like somebody like fat wreck wouldn't want him on their label um, i said it from day one he's gonna be so fucking famous one day <laughs> well he's definitely got the the ability to perform i mean their live show with the it's the way it's really the way that oscar and oscar interact on the stage holy shit that's hilarious i've only ever seen videos of the two but fuck it is you feel that love right like like i say i always like i visualize things constantly and when i see him and oscar it's kind of what i want for me and my daughters you know it's that that love it's that camaraderie it's that shared you know vision but also just being able to be almost each other's best friends at the same time and that's definitely you feel the love like oscar senior you did a fantastic job raising that son of yours like <laughs> your secrets because i would love to know what you did so i you know can get that with my kids too so you know there's that clip that circulated on the internet of eddie van halen after he died where the kid got up and asked him if he could jam with anybody living or dead who would it be and he thought for a second he said i'd play with my father again and oscar and oscar are getting to actually do that right now and they don't take it for granted which is the coolest part like they get the fact that this is not a usual run of the mill thing and that kind of things are happening for them and they're having a good time and it's a good thing and not everybody gets that. And um, I, I think it, it comes through when they, when you see them play that they are just enjoying themselves and they get along as a group of guys playing and there's the, definitely the dad and son thing going. So it, we'll see what happens. I, I can't see Epitaph or Fat Wreck not wanting some Oscar caps in their life. Yeah. Down, down the road everybody wants some oscar caps in their life <laughs> they, they should he's an excellent guy and it's nice to see somebody who puts in the work you know i i kind of get a little i don't want to say pissed because i don't uh you know we've interviewed people and they're like oh i just plug and play and showed up and i just recorded this album in like five minutes and then i left and that was it and it's like you can kind of hear that in the album too and it's like oh that thought wasn't put there and then you have oscar who i've never spoken to oscar i can't wait for the day i do get to speak <laughs> holy shit that kid's gonna get so many questions and <laughs> he's gonna be giving me advice because i need it i want it i'm here for it um but yeah like he puts in the work and it's paying off so much not only through his music but just watching him grow in his character everything man that kid like um, if you guys don't know, Oscar is actually the one that recorded our uh, music for uh, Sound the Alarm. So our show that's hosting at the end of January called that kid up a week. Literally a week. We were like, hey, we think it would be really cool. Yeah, if you don't want to do it, you don't have to. The can, next can day you... he's like, it's written. I just have to record it. Do you mean he? you commissioned a recording from him that he put together and, and recorded? And then that's awesome. It's so special, and it is 100% for Riot Squad Sound the Alarm. And you heard it first here, because no one actually knows that yet. <laughs> that kid is something. He uh, literally, I, I mean, I love him. I, and I will shout it from the rooftops. He's great. I can't wait to see where he goes. I can't wait to continue working with him. I think he's brilliant. Um, but I hit him up. I was like, you know, Terry and I are doing this this new show. We, we, we're going to hopefully get like a little intro and stuff. And he's like, what were you thinking? Done. <laughs> and then the next day he's like, Hey, it's all written and stuff. I just have to record it really quick for you. He, like, <laughs> so is it a punk song or does it sound like Prince? Cause he could probably do the, either. <laughs> we have not heard it yet. Huh. We haven't like, heard it just yet. We said but I fucked him completely. So we told what? him, you know, there's no do your thing. You know who we are. You know, our vibe, do your thing. So I'm excited to see what he came up with. This is good information because if he's recording right now, I can drop him a line and say, 
maybe we should talk about those songs you sent me before. Oh, no, Mark, he's going to yell at us, damn it. Okay, I'll wait. I won't say anything. <laughs> I, don't, I, I won't blow up this, blow this up, but... Um, you can blow it up, it's okay. If he's recording again, we might be able to get an next record out of him. I'm here for that. Because <laughs> I cannot get enough of this. It's great. My, my favorite track on the whole record is Pick Yourself Up. I was like, oh, oh. He doesn't want to hear that, though. I, I told him that too. I was like, listen, you guys got to make another video. And he's like, you're going to say, pick yourself up. And I was, and I was like, no, I'm not. <laughs> so we, I said some other song, but um, he, I don't think he's very partial to that one. Oh, uh, I love it. I love it. Too. That's such a good time too. Um, you know, personally for that song and when that album dropped, it just, it came at the right time in my life. That's why I connected with it so hard too. And I think, especially with this year, you know, we needed kind of like a 2020 anthem to fucking just try to move forward and keep going. And that song is exactly it. I'm surprised he didn't make a video out of it and that he may or may not. Oscar, we, you tell us <laughs> if you really like the song or not. But, you know, we like it. Yeah. You know, if there's three of us here that are voting on that one. I vote, I vote pick yourself up or prove yourself. So I'm, I'm, I'm honestly here for anything. I forget which one he decided on. Uh, I can't even remember, so I, I'd just be making it up. But um, <laughs> yeah, I think like, um, so some of the songs that he has sent me, he has been concerned that they might not be Stolen Wheelchair songs. So I'm trying to convey to him that Stolen Wheelchair songs are whatever you tell us are Stolen Wheelchair songs. But I get where he's coming from because I was a kid once too. And I did stupid shit like break up my band and start a new one because I thought it had to sound a little bit different to accommodate a song or something. So um I think that might be where his reservations are on that song. Well, and the cool thing about what you just said is, you know, it keep doing your thing, Oscar, because then you put him next to a band like Art Thieves, who has 47 different genres on one record. <laughs> it's, it's beautiful. You know, like if we could hear that out of Oscar. Could you, could you imagine what that would sound like? I, Jesus. Someday he'll get there. It's going to be awesome. I'm here for it. We're going to yeah. get like some sort of pet sounds out of him someday. That's just going to be like stacked <laughs> recordings. And sometimes, too, when it comes to musicians um, that have put earlier, I'm going to go back to Bad Cop, Bad Cop, because Laura was talking about them. Like, their earlier album just was about shit. They, and Jenny has said this, too. It's shit about where they wouldn't be talking about now. And now that they matured and they've grown and kind of things have happened, it's just a whole different, like, message. I can't wait to hear what that is from Oscar, that's going to be cool to see in five years, kind of his perspective on things. Cause his perspective now is fucking insane. I can't imagine what he has to say in five years. I'm definitely here for it. I'm here for it next week. If he wants that. <laughs> five years to be like, And you know, he's a, he's going to tell you too, like his perspective, because like when you first heard that first EP and he has that song, no decaf, mm -hmm. that is the most important shit to a 16 year old. Um, at that point in his life, you know, yeah. like he thought to write a song about it. So where's he going to, what's his point of view going to be? Like you said, five, 10 years from now, I can't wait to find out. Hopefully I'm still around, you know? Oh my God. You get to a certain point <laughs> know, in life. Right? You, start, like, yeah. you got to start adding that on in the end. Yeah. It's no, I, I did. I, Terry and I are doing like a little, uh, little sneak peek of our top 10 records of 2020. And hands down that was mine for sure and I mean it was highly anticipated because you know like I said I loved that that EP that he put out and I was just like this is fucking awesome like I can't wait to hear what this kid and this band has to offer and then actually listening to it for the month that it's been out now it's it's so great and it makes me so excited for punk it makes me so excited for <laughs> shows again when they come right. back Oh my god! I can't wait to be in that pit. Are you fucking kidding me? It's gonna be great. Seeing it's them just so makes you feel sixteen again. It's just something it's about that. it. Like, it makes you want to go rip it up and break some bones. Yeah. yeah, I love that. Who doesn't want to do that right now? And, and there's no band, there's no reunion band I've seen that has made me feel like I was a teenager again. It, I see the reunion show. I always think like, well, it's them, but it's you know twenty years later, so it's cool. But. Well, that's the thing. Maybe to feel like a teenager, maybe you need a teenager up on stage. You do, because Stolen Wheelchairs is 10 seconds into their set, and I already feel like I'm 17 again. Like, I'm, I'm ready to go to my shift at Johnny's Food Master and bag groceries. 
Oh, I love that invocations of feelings and shit whenever it comes to like that music. And yeah, stolen wheelchairs. <clears throat> and I love that you have that younger to newer generation too working together because, you know, I'm sure Oscar Sr. may have some influence on Oscar Jr.'s songwriting. So, and I do feel that come through. Like there's those older riffs that you can pick up like back in the day because I'm assuming Oscar that is around my age and it's like oh yeah that's the shit we used to hang out but then it just fucking boom switches and turns around and then it's like holy what the just happened here that's amazing like man that kid's going places i i think you're right yep i would have to agree a hundred percent we love oscar (laughs) so mark um what's coming up for state line is there anything you guys can share right now um some I know point we're kind of sitting in limbo same as with us really just yeah i mean it's, i'm surprised things even happened this year at all i thought we were going to be pushing the stolen wheelchairs next year um but the ramala record and stolen wheelchairs came this year so next year the only thing definitely is going to be michael kane in the morning after is but there's a the potential for a couple of reissues um for older boston bands um I kind of want to do a couple of those because they really do help keep a label afloat. Like if I had for every one of those art thieves are <clears throat> the newer bands, you know, I might unload like four or five of the Pinkin and Thugs or Ducky Boys or Oxymoron. So they kind of keep things. Yeah. Going. So I kind of have to do, I, I want to go back and do some more reissues to kind of make it possible so we can do some more new stuff down the road. So hopefully that will happen next year. Yeah, I think you're actually the first record owner, label owner that we've had the chance to speak to. So uh, this is actually quite unique because usually when we we speak to musicians and kind of learn their process, but you're kind of a whole different side of it. It's kind of like juggling where you want things to happen. And like right now, I'm sure you can't book anything because things aren't sadly open. Like how do you try to keep your musicians like motivated to encourage them to you know still write shit but do it in a safe i guess manner well these dudes are all highly motivated themselves so diablo gato made a video this year um they also released a bear um the they're all really doing stuff you know michael kane in the morning after has made their album this year um i think they were all pretty ambitious so they kind of just do their own thing um but I'm not going to, like I said about Art Thieves, I'm not going to encourage any of those guys to like try to keep their bands going just for the sake of playing music when it, if it could result in something awful. Yes. Um, it's just not worth it. You know, there's, there's a reason that the reason that Russian Rats by Art Thieves is so good is because Andrew means it so much. And it's like a, it's like an album written to his three daughters. Well, and, um, that just I, changed everything. That whole. Well, that there's just- a reason that this pink vinyl. And uh, the girls helped me. I, they, they're my um, uh, interns at State Line. Oh, um, cute. I went down to, to Braintree with the, the stuff and they helped me assemble the records. Um, but it's, yeah, it, when you listen to a lot of those words, he's talking to his girls and telling them like how they're not going to be treated, and what, they, what, what they should not stand for, what they, what they should accept in life and stuff. It's really, if you go back and listen to it with that perspective. I am now. <laughs> it, it does kind of make it even more interesting and it like even more charming charming i love it it's better well, than you know us as being parents too we can relate to it on that kind of level as well so to be able to look at it from different perspectives and now that we know that like oh yeah he wrote this fort for you for these reasons it'll give us a whole other reason to go back and listen to it and kind of feel it that same way too and i love when music can do that for you and you can kind of take that ride with the artist yeah when you yeah when you get to know the story behind some of these things i guess it it does paint a new picture really that song untouchables i think will change if you consider the fact that he's talking to his girls yeah i'm definitely after this yeah you know (laughs) I'm going to turn off and listen and probably cry some nice, ugly tears I haven't (laughs) done in, like, years. So I'm excited. I'm not actually excited for the ugly tears, but I'm excited. (laughs) I love emotion. I do. I really love the way it makes me feel. I don't know if it's because of my past life and, you know, being able to feel. Uh, For a long time, that part was numb. So 
you know, be able to have music be my medium to be able to use those feelings, I think is always a great time for me, um, very personal time. So I'm excited to listen. Um, Mark, if we wanted to get a hold of you or check out your stuff, how will we be able to do so? Oh, just go to getpunk.com. It's easy to remember that way. It yeah. was going to be get vinyl, but somebody got me, got that before I got <laughs> it. It's getpunk.com. Very cool. So again, we are with Mark from Stateline Records. Mark, thank you so much for taking the time to go over Laura's collection of rad birthday presents, even though you didn't intend them to be birthday presents. Well, you know what? Maybe I did. Maybe you did. 